Chapter 08 Black, White and Gray In Washington, with policy now informally set, the debate over the Nazi scientist program became intense inside the State War Navy Coordinating Committee, SWNCC. Like its successor, Organization, the National Security Council, SWNCC, acted as the president's principal forum for dealing with issues related to foreign policy and national security. The State Department was vocal in its opposition to the program. Exacerbating the situation for the State Department was a parallel issue. It had recently become embroiled in South American countries, Argentina and Uruguay in particular, were known to be giving safe haven to Nazi war criminals who had escaped from Germany at the end of the war. The State Department had been putting pressure on these countries to repatriate Nazis back to Europe to face war crimes charges. If it came out that the State Department was providing not only safe haven but employment opportunities for Nazi scientists in the United States, that would be cause for an international scandal. And while some generals and colonels in the War Department were decidedly for the Nazi science programs, others were fundamentally opposed to the idea. A. Secretly recorded conversation between two generals at the Pentagon summed up the conflict that the very idea of German scientists working for the U.S. military created. One of the ground rules for bringing them over is that it will be temporary, and at the return of their exploitation they will be sent back to Germany, said one general, whose name was redacted. The second general agreed. I'm opposed and pop powers, a nickname for a Pentagon official, is opposed, the whole War Department is opposed, he said to open our arms and bring in German technicians and treat them as honored guests was a very bad idea. The Department of Justice was not happy about the voluminous workload that background checks on former enemy aliens would require. The Department of Labor was concerned about laws governing alien labor and the Department of Commerce was concerned about patent rights. In an Attempt to ease the contention, Under Secretary of War Robert Patterson sent a memorandum to the War Department General Staff stating that the person to mediate these issues was John J. McCloy, the Assistant Secretary of War and Chairman of SWNCC. John J. McCloy would become an especially significant player in Operation Paperclip starting in 1949, but now, in the summer of 1945, he wore two hats related to the issue of Nazi scientists. On the one hand, Under Secretary of War Robert Patterson had put McCloy in charge of coordinating policy regarding Nazi scientists coming to the United States to work. On the other hand, Patterson's boss Secretary of War Henry Stimson had given McCloy the job of helping to develop the war crimes program. McCloy's position regarding the exploitation of Nazi science and scientists was clear. He believed that the program would help foster American military superiority while engendering economic prosperity. To McCloy, those ends justified any means. It was not that McCloy believed that the Nazis should go unpunished, at least not in the summer of 1945. For that, McCloy was a strong supporter of the International Military Tribunal, IMT, and the idea of a war crimes trial. But he was someone who saw these two categories as black and white. There were scientists, and there were war criminals. In McCoy's eyes, a war criminal was a Himmler, a Hess, a Goring, or a Bormann. Scientists, like industrialists, were the backbone of a healthy economy in this new, post-war world. In the summer of 1945, McCoy was regularly briefed on the capture and arrest of these war criminals as they were rounded up and taken to a top-secret interrogation facility in Luxembourg, codenamed Ashcan, 
where they would be squeezed for information before facing judgment at Nuremberg. John Dollaboy, an officer with Army Intelligence, G2, the Collecting and Dissemination Division, spent a significant portion of the last eight months of the war watching and rewatching Triumph of the Will, the three-hour-long Nazi propaganda film by Hitler's favorite filmmaker, Lenny Riefenstahl. Every Thursday night, inside a screening room at Camp Ritchie, America's military intelligence, Training Center, located 80 miles north of Washington in the Catoctin Mountains, the 26-year-old Dollaboy used the film to teach German order of battle and Nazi party hierarchy to colonels, generals, and intelligence officers preparing to go off to war. The Triumph of the Will documentary was an ideal teaching tool and enabled Dollaboy to point out to his students how individuals within the Nazi party hierarchy spoke and gestured, what insignia. They wore, who was subordinate to whom. Between the hateful speeches and the endless parades, the fawning inner circle and the Nuremberg rallies, John Dollaboy had become so familiar with Hitler's inner circle that he could almost recite their speeches himself. He enjoyed teaching, but, like so many dedicated Americans of his generation, Dollaboy wished to see action overseas. There was a tinge of envy as well. He stayed in touch with his former colleagues. From officer candidate school, most of whom had been sent to Europe months ago. Many had already been promoted to captains and majors. As the war in Europe drew to a close, John Dollaboy had accepted that he was, in all likelihood, not going to be sent overseas as part of an interrogation team, called an IPW team, to interview newly captured prisoners of war. Then, on Easter Sunday, April 1, 1945, he received orders to ship out with the next detachment. Steaming out of the New York Harbor only days later, he was standing on the deck of the Isle de France when someone handed him a telegram. He'd been promoted to first lieutenant. Things moved fast after he'd crossed the Atlantic. On April 13, Dollaboya's ship landed in West Scotland. Every vessel in the harbor was at half-mast, President Roosevelt had died the day before. A quick train trip to London bore witness to appalling devastation. Piles of rubble filled both sides of every street. Dollaboya's channel crossing took place under a full moon and he was grateful to arrive in the war-torn port at Le Havre, France, without incident. Up until then our move from camp. Ritchie to Le Havre had been well orchestrated, explains Dollaboy. Now chaos set in. Driving. Into Munich, destroyed vehicles and weaponry littered the road. In the clearings in the woods sat. Small fleets of wrecked Luftwaffe airplanes, their wings torn off and their fuselages pockmarked with holes. Corpses rotted in ditches. Suddenly the war was very real, Dollaboy recalls. His first assignment was at the Dachau concentration camp, just two days after its liberation. Dollaboy had been sent to Dachau to look over groups of captured German soldiers to see if important. Generals, party officials, or scientists were hiding out among the crowd. Primarily, I was to watch for high-ranking Nazis in disguise, remembers Dollaboy. We had reports that many of them were passing themselves off as ordinary German soldiers, thus hoping to be overlooked in the confusion and to disappear. His job was to intuit the meaning of certain manners of walk, greeting, and speech. Dollaboy was on the lookout for anyone who might be useful to the Allies for a more detailed interrogation at a facility elsewhere. At Dachau, John Dollaboy scoured faces in the crowd for telltale marks, things that could not be hidden. The most obvious among them were the dueling scars of the Nazi elite. But at Camp Ritchie, Dollaboy had also become an expert in signs of concealment recently shaved facial hair or patches. 
pulled off uniforms were indicators that a man had something to hide. True expertise, Dollaboy knew, lay in recognizing nuance. After a few days at Dachau, Dollaboy received another assignment. He proceeded to Central. Continental Prisoner of War Enclosure No. 32, or CCPWE No. 32. The mission he was now on was classified top secret. Everyone he asked about CCPWE No. 32 said that they had never heard of it before. When Dollaboya's driver left the borders of Germany and began heading into Luxembourg, Dollaboya became overwhelmed with memories. Luxembourg, of all places, how capricious to be on. Assignment here. John Dollaboy was born in Luxembourg. He had moved to America when he was a 12-year-old boy, with his father, his mother had died in the great influenza pandemic. Driving. Into Luxembourg in 1945, Dollaboy was seeing his native country for the first time in 14 years. As his army jeep made its way into a little spa town called Mondorf Les Baines, images of his youth flooded his mind. He recalled Mondorf's beautiful park, a quiet stream on which one could row a boat, lots of old trees, and acres of flowers. Mondorf was built a few miles from the Moselle River. In antiquity, developed by the Romans as a health resort. It was known for its restorative qualities, its mineral baths and fresh air. How different it all looked now, another small city devastated by war. Most homes and shops had been plundered or destroyed. Driving along the main boulevard, Dollaboy observed how the facades of many houses had been blown off. He could see people carrying on with their lives inside of what was left of their homes. Only when his jeep pulled up to its destination did Dollaboy realize that he'd arrived at the palace. Hotel. It was unrecognizable to him. A 15-foot-high fence ran around the main building, on top of which was a double-stringed curl of barbed wire. There was a second fence that appeared to be electrified. Camouflage netting hung from panels of fencing. Wide canvas sheets had been strung from tree to tree. Huge Klieg lights illuminated the place. There were four guard towers, each manned by American soldiers holding powerful machine guns. Not even in photographs had John Dollaboy seen an Allied prison facility in the European war theater as heavily fortified as this place was. At the front gate there was a jeep, parked and with its engine turned off. A stern-faced sergeant sat inside. His name tag read Sergeant of the Guard, Robert Block. Block addressed Dollaboy with a nod. Good afternoon, Sergeant, Dollaboy said. I'm reporting for duty here. Block just stared at him. Dollaboy recalled asking what kind of place this was. What was going on? Inside? Block said he had not been inside. There was a long, uncomfortable pause. Finally, Block spoke. To get in here you need a pass. Signed by God. He nodded at the prisoner of war facility behind him. And have somebody verify. The signature. Dollaboy handed over his papers. After Block looked at them, the gate swung open and Dollaboy was waved inside. In spite of its fortifications, the palace hotel remained surprisingly unscathed by war. The boomerang-shaped building was five stories tall. The fountain at the front entrance lacked water, its stone-carved nymph rising up from an empty pool. Inside the hotel foyer Dollaboy was greeted by two guards. A third soldier handed him a key and pointed up a flight of stairs. He told Dollaboy to leave his things in room 30, on the second floor. I climbed up the stairs, located room 30 and let myself in with the key he had given me. It was an 
ordinary hotel room, remembers Dollar Boy, with rather noisy wallpaper. Inside, the fancy light. Fixtures and plush furniture of a grand hotel had been replaced by a folding table, two chairs, and an army cot. Dollar Boy unpacked his duffel bag. There was a knock on the door. Ashcan may have been heavily fortified on the exterior, but inside the facility, the prisoners were free to roam around. Dollaboy opened the door and stood face to face with a large man dressed in a ratty pearl gray uniform with gold braids on the collars and gold insignia on the shoulder pads. He held a pair of trousers draped over one arm. Clicking his heels, he nodded and introduced himself as if he were at a party, not in a prison. The man opened his mouth and barked, Goring. Reich's Marshal. So this was Hermann Goring. Dollaboy recognized him immediately from so many screenings of Triumph of the Will. Here was the man in flesh and blood. Goring was arguably the most notorious of Hitler's inner circle still alive former commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, director of the four-year plan, Hitler's long-acknowledged successor until the perceived betrayal at the very end. It was Hermann Göring who ordered security police chief Reinhard Heydrich to organize and coordinate plans for a solution to the Jewish question. At once I understood my assignment, recalled Dollaboy. He was here in Luxembourg to interrogate the highest-ranking war criminals in the Nazi party. This was not a Nazi propaganda film. The individuals who had so populated his mind and his teaching at Camp Ritchie for the past eight months were right here. And they were all prisoners now. Goring stood before Dollaboy, panting. Goring said he had been unfairly tricked by his captors. He had been told he was going to a palatial spa, Dollaboy explained. When Goring arrived at Ashcan with his valet, Robert Kropp, he was expecting a vacation. He brought along eleven suitcases and twenty thousand paracotin pills, and had made sure his toenails and fingernails had been varnished to a bright red shine for his stay. That the spa at Mondorf had lost its chandeliers and been turned into a maximum security prison. Complex was not what Goring had in mind. His mattress was made of straw, Goring barked at. Dollar boy. He didn't have a pillow. A man of his rank deserved more. Dollar boy looked at Goring. Made a mental note. Are you by chance a welfare officer who will see to it that we are treated correctly, according to Articles of War? Goring asked Dollaboy. In this question, Dollaboy saw opportunity as an interrogator. Yes, he said. He would be working along those lines. Goring was pleased. He made a great show again of heel clicking bowing and taking his 280 pounds out of my room. Goring returned to his fellow prisoners. He told the other Nazis about the new officer's arrival and his responsibilities to see better treatment for all of them. Suddenly, everyone wanted to speak. With First Lieutenant John Dollaboy. CCPWE No. 32 was filled with Nazi bonds and the big wheels, as Dollaboy and the other. Interrogators called them. Hans Frank, the Jew butcher of Krakow, arrived at Ashcan on a stretcher, in silk pajamas, drenched in blood. He had tried to kill himself by slashing his own throat. Frank was captured with his 38 volume diary, written during the war, a damning confession of many crimes he was guilty of. Dark eyed and balding, noted Ashcan's commandant, Colonel. Burton Andrus, Frank had pale hairy hands. Other prisoners included members of the former. German General Staff, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, Chief of the Oberkommando, der Wehrmacht. OKW, or Armed Forces High Command, General Alfred Jodl, Keitel's Chief of Operations, Grand. 
Admiral Karl Donitz, Commander of Submarines and Commander-in-Chief of the German Navy, Field. Marshal Albert Kesselring, former Chief of Armed Forces Italy and later Supreme Commander West. Joachim von Ribbentrop, Foreign Minister, and Albert Speer, Minister of Armaments and War. Production. These were the men who personally helped Hitler plan and execute World War II and the Holocaust, those who hadn't escaped, perished, or committed suicide. In a second circle, or clique, there were the real Nazi gangsters, Dollaboy explained, the old fighters, who had been with Hitler at the beginning of his rise to power. Among this group were Robert Ley, Labour Front leader, Julius Stryker, editor of the anti-Semitic newspaper, and Propaganda tool, Der Sturmer, Alfred Rosenberg, Nazi philosopher, Arthur Sison Court, the man who betrayed Austria and became Reichskommissar of Holland, and Wilhelm Frick, former minister of the interior and Reichsprotector of Bohemia Moravia. Stripped of their power, small details spoke volumes to Dollaboy. Goring was terrified of thunderstorms. Keitel was obsessed with sunbathing and staring at his reflection in Ashcan's only mirror in its entrance hall. Robert Ley was repeatedly reprimanded for masturbating in the bathtub. Joachim von Ribbentrop, named by the Nazi Ministry of Propaganda as the best-dressed man in Germany for nine consecutive years, was a lazy slob. Day in and day out, John Dollaboy interviewed them. Almost all the men at Ashcan were eager to talk, Dollaboy recalls. They felt neglected if they hadn't been interrogated by someone for several days. Their favorite pastime was casting blame. The greatest challenge for Dollaboy and his fellow interrogators was determining, or trying to, determine who was lying and who was telling the truth. Cross-examination Playing one prisoner off the other, according to Dollaboy, was a tactic that worked best. Often, I was taken into their confidence when they needed a shoulder to cry on, Dollaboy. Explains. At Mondorf, they still couldn't believe they would be tried for their crimes.